Dear all, it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you my colleague from the Protestant University of Wuppertal, Michaela Geiger, with whom I spent hours and hours during the last month preparing our conference. She has been professor for Old Testament studies since, since 2015 and ordained minister of the Protestant Church Rhineland. She holds a doctorate from the University of Marburg. Her dissertation thesis deals with conceptions of space in the book of Deuteronomy. Currently, she is finishing a monograph about an angel in the Old Testament reconceptualizing the messenger of God in redactional and traditional historical perspectives. As chair of Septuaginta Deutsch, she is responsible for the international conferences of the study of the Septuagint hosted every other year in Wuppertal. She is particularly engaged in completing Old Testament exegesis through transdisciplinary approaches in corporations such as disability studies, visual arts and resilience studies, as well as narratology. Along these lines, she co-chairs a local unit on visionary spaces, narrating spaces in vision reports, with Matthias Martinez meeting on Thursday afternoon. In her contribution today, she will lead us over into the sphere of angels and other divine beings. With, um, so, we are looking forward to experience the other. Very welcome, Michaela. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and the possibility to share some recent insights on resilience and angels with you. Dear all, resilience was something most of us were in need of last year. The COVID pandemic turned life upside down. Many people felt reduced to a small screen, while others found themselves pushed to their limits between home office and homeschooling. For some, isolation was the most trying experience. For others, the fear of infection or the concern for relatives. There has been a lot to cope with. In the course of the last weeks, Germany and neighboring countries were hit by floods. People died, many lost their homes, belongings or businesses. And again, we face a dire need of resilience. The American Psychological Association defines resilience as follows. Resilience is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats or even significant sources of stress, such as family and relationship problems, serious health problems or workplace and financial st stressors. It means bouncing back from difficult experiences. In the aftermath of 9-11, the American Psychological Association launched a public education campaign called Road to Resilience to collect and spread information and thus help people cope with a chronic sense of stress and uncertainty. During the last COVID year, the APA roadmap 10 ways to build resilience attracted further retention. The underlying assumption is people can be trained in developing resilience, a point that has not gone unchallenged. Talking about resilience in the face of crises is ambivalent. It can be life-saving to be resilient and, on the other hand, Resilience can become a further challenge for those affected. They not only have to survive, but also do so as successfully as possible. Sociologists like Stefanie Gräfe or Ulrich Bröckling view resilience as a phenomenon of our time. The term resilience presupposes that the world around us has become difficult, uncertain, or even threatening. Faced with global economic crises, pandemics, or with extreme weather due to the uh, climate change, everyone has to train his or her resilient self instead of changing the circumstances. Many people in Western Europe have become newly aware of the vulnerability of life in the past year. 
Resilience is often tied in with the hope of restoring life and old verities, bouncing back to normal. In other societies, as for many individuals, vulnerability has proven a lifelong experience. Against this background, resilience assumes the meaning of having sufficient resources to survive difficult times and not to lose hope of a better future. This holds true for the people at the time of the Old Testament as well, who were, as we learn from the scriptures, constantly aware of the vulnerability of their lives. Studying resilience in the Old Testament should hinge on the contextuality of the concept. This is pointed out in particular by Catherine Panterbrick, anthropologist at Yale University. Consequently, she has decided to focus her research in Afghanistan on families, not on individuals. She theorizes less and comes closer to everyday language. Panterbrick arrives at the conclusion, if you had to boil down resilience to just one single word, that word is hope. Hope gives meaning and order to suffering in life and helps to articulate a coherent narrative to link the future to the past and present. This differs a lot from the APA definition, which identifies factors in resilience such as supporting relationships, confidence in one's own abilities, skills in problem solving, as well as the capacity to manage strong feelings. It comes as no surprise that the APA accesses resilience as an individual psychological issue. Pantabrick, by contrast, introduces the term structural resilience and explains it like this. We need to provide people with the resources that facilitate their ability to create a better future and construct meaning in life, and thus enable them to sustain a sense of hope and dignity. With these preliminary observations and precautions in mind, let us now turn to Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is, according to Thomas Krauss, the most frequently attested biblical text to be found on archaeological objects, including wall inscriptions, tomb chambers, papyri as well as amulets, which bear witness to the apotropaic use of both uh, the Hebrew and the Greek version of the Septuagint. The psalm forms the end of the Qumran incantation scroll 11q11, which was apparently used in liturgical invocations. The Babylonian Talmud, Shavuot 15b, calls the psalm Song of Evil Spirits, Song of Plagues, and also attests to a magic use. Quote, it is related that Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi would recite these verses to protect him from evil spirits during the night and fall asleep while saying them. Quotations from Psalm 91 are written on Aramaic magic bowls as well from century 6 to 8. They were buried in the ground to banish the demons beneath them. This widely attested apotropaic use suggests that people resorted to Psalm 91 in different contexts and various emergency situations. The psalm was believed to avert evil, to increase security, build up confidence and, in modern terms, to foster resilience. Let us approach Psalm 91 in more detail to uncover some of its many resources and the situations of distress addressed. It reads, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High abides in the shadow of Shaddai. I say to Adonai, my refuge and fortress, my God in whom I trust. He will save you from the snare of the fowler, from the pestilence of destruction. With his pinions he will cover you, under his wings you will find refuge. Shield and buckler is his faithfulness. You will not fear the terror of the night, the arrow that flies by day, the pestilence that walks in the darkness, or the plague that ravages at noon. 
A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right, but it shall not touch you. Only with your own eyes will you behold the punishment of the wicked you will see. Indeed, you, Adonai, are my refuge. You took the Most High as your haven. No evil will befall you, no disease will approach your tent. For he will command his messengers on your behalf to guard you in all your ways. In their palm they will carry you, lest you hurt your foot on a stone. On the lion and the cobra you will tread. You will trample the young lion and the serpent underfoot. Because he holds fast to me, I will deliver him. I will keep him safe, for he knows my name. When he calls on me, I will answer him. With him, I will be in distress. I will rescue him and grant him honor. With long life, I will satisfy him and make him see my salvation. The communicative structure of Psalm 91 consists of a trialogue. In verses 1 to 2, a supplicant turns to Adonai in the first person. In verses 3 to 13, a second person, perhaps a priest, answers the supplicant and quotes his confession of trust in verse 9a. Finally, in verses 14 to 16, it is Adonai who speaks and confirms via third person what the supplicant and the officiant have said. This trialogue is, as Erich Zenger shows, a literary composition of an originally cultic ritual, be it from the Second Temple or, which to me is more likely, from the realm of family and household religion, as Freuchtenhill convincingly suggests. The ritualistic performance of the psalm surrounds the supplicant with an overarching sphere of protection. The psalm opens with a fourfold invocation of God. The praying person addresses God by the four names Elion, Shaddai, Adonai and Elohim and combines them with four spaces of protection – shelter, shadow, refuge and fortress. In a declarative speech act, the praying person puts her or himself under divine protection. This does not apply to a concrete situation, but works comprehensively in view of the fundamental vulnerability of the person praying. Consequently, the words can be applied to any context through the ages, as we have seen. In verses 3 to 8, the liturgist holds out the promise of protection to the supplicant by, again, invoking four spaces of shelter which are contrasted with four menaces in verses 5 and on. Terror, arrow, pestilence and plague. The dangers are animated. The arrow flies, pestilence walks and plague ravages. Like the arrow, they can strike in an instant and unnoticed. They can walk undetected among people and leave a trail of destruction. At no time of the day are people safe from them, neither at night and in the dark, nor during the day and in the hot midday sun. An apt description for a pandemic. The term deva occurs even twice. In verses 3 and 6, it denotes a deadly plague and is usually translated into pestilence. Deva rarely comes alone. The term belongs to the affliction triad, famine, pestilence and sword, at the mercy of which people in ancient Israel found themselves time and again. Famine could bring on disease, pestilence could bring on hunger, and war was usually associated with all three of them. While God himself is always considered the instigator of the affliction triad, the psalm suggests that other powers are at work. Arrow and plagues are attributes of the Assyrian deity Reshef, a god of the underworld, Reshef causes disaster and spreads diseases with his bow and arrows. Habakkuk 3 verse 5 depicts Reshef as member of the entourage of Adonai. Before his face goes forth Deva and Reshef follows in his footsteps. 
This suggests that in the Old Testament, Reshef is a demonized version of an ancient god, now submitted to Israel's god. The second term for plague in verse 6, Ketev, is only attested four times in the Old Testament. It bears overtones of a divine name as well. In the Old Testament, Ketev is, uh, according to Wyatt, living as a spiritual and highly dangerous reality in the minds of poets and readers. The allusions to demonic powers are even more visible in the ancient translations. The Targum in verse 6 speaks of Shedin, demons, and thus echoes the verb Shadat, destroy, while the Septuagint renders the same verb as daimonion. The psalm puts forth metaphors that visualize being at the mercy of plagues and other confederates of death, even naming secretly the demonic forces. The powers can be named and thus banished by placing them in the frame of their disempowerment by God. God saves, verse 3, and creates a fourfold protective space, verse 4. For the supplicants, it holds true. You will not fear terror and error, pestilence and plague. This applies to all daytimes, night and day, darkness and noon. What does resilience mean in the face of such a fundamentally vulnerable life? First, it means surviving. To be spared when thousands fall next to you, like verse 7 envisions. Last year, I considered this verse an exaggeration. But after seeing the videos from Brazilian or Italian COVID graveyards, I came to understand that being spared is a lot to hope for, and a hard fate at the same time. Second, resilience means to live in the face of fear, but with deepened confidence that God will provide a space safe from evil and a shelter from strokes of fate. These are the basic requirements for a decent life, a resilient life. What is more, the sun provides yet another resource. It offers angelic protection. The Malachim belong to the assertion of the priestly voice, which comprises verses 9b to 13. Verse 11 speaks of Malachim in general. Only the personal suffix Malachav associates them with Adonai. This terminology makes it clear that the concept of the messengers in Psalm 91 is profoundly different from the figure of the Malach Adonai, which appears in many Old Testament narratives. Permanent protection is not among the Malach Adonai's tasks, but delivering a message is mandatory. Verse 11 marks a change both in the concept of the Malachim and in the metaphoric concept of the psalm. Up to now, the psalm visualizes protection spatially and statically as a safe place, whereas the threat of danger is identified through movement. The arrow flies, pestilence walks, and plague shall not come near. Imagining a safe place fosters the ability to take care of oneself and mitigates the feeling of being at the mercy of others. Verse 11 relates the idea of a safe place to the notion of movement. The supplicant is meant to imagine himself going about daily life or away on travel, nonetheless entirely protected and secure. For he will command his messengers on your behalf to guard you in all your ways. In their palms they will carry you, lest you hurt your foot on a stone. The addressee is in the messenger's focus. Five suffixes in the second person leave no doubt that all protecting activities take place only for the benefit of the supplicant. Verse 12 depicts the sheltering in concrete bodily terms. The messengers carry the supplicant in their palms. The plural kapayim heightens intensity and comprehension. Such hyperbolical protection is normally attributed to God. In Exodus 33, God protects Moses by covering him with his hand. 
Above all, the protection promised on the part of the messengers recalls Israel's being kept safe during the Exodus. Deuteronomy 32 uh, verse 11 and Exodus 19 verse 4 state that during the Exodus, Adonai bore Israel on vultures' wings. And even the motive of the stumbling foot from Psalm 91 alludes to Exodus tradition. Deuteronomy 8 reads, no less hyperbolical, the clothes upon you did not wear out, nor did your feet swell these 40 years. The clearest allusion, however, points to the sending of the Exodus messenger in Exodus 23. See, I am sending a messenger before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. In Psalm 91, verses 11 to 12, thus concentrate God's and the Exodus messenger's actions during the Exodus towards all Israel like a burning lens. Now, many messengers shelter one single supplicant. The focus intensifies and personalizes divine protection. At the same time, the supplicant fulfills his part in the collective memory of the Exodus. The integration into Israelite history awakens a sense of belonging and brings back memories of enduring and overcoming wilderness episodes. Along these lines, the allusions to Exodus have a stabilizing effect on the individual's resilience. The idea of sheltering messengers fits into the resilience-fostering structure of the psalm, while at the same time giving it a further twist. Whereas the various metaphors of safe places grant the supplicant a form of passive protection, the image of the accompanying messengers allow the supplicant to move and act and to live his or her everyday life. Beyond this, the messengers personalize the protection offered. Instead of abstract spatial metaphors, at this point there are physical beings who with their hands ensure that nothing will happen to the supplicant. This concept of protection explicitly focuses on the vulnerable body. The linguists George Lakoff and Mark Johnson have made it clear that human thought processes are largely metaphorical. According to them, metaphor is pervasive in everyday life, not just in language, but in thought and action. Or, as stated in their famous book title, we live by metaphors. This means it matters by which metaphorical concepts we live. Psalm 91 contributes a lot to the treasury of resilience-fostering metaphors. The psalm supersedes images of vulnerability and subjection to demonic powers and replaces them by metaphors of, of protection and, even more, of guarded agency. The metaphors in Psalm 91 enable the supplicants to conceive of a reality which is exposed to demonic powers but nonetheless under God's protection. Psalm 91 places the praying person into a framework of relations. While his or her distress isolates the supplicant, the psalm supports the reintegration into the community. At the beginning of the psalm, the troubled eye voice takes initiative and seeks refuge in his or her God. The supplicant's search is given resonance by the voice of the officiant who pronounces Adonai's protection upon the praying person. In verses 14 to 16, finally, both statements are endorsed by Adonai's own word. By using the full number of seven verbs, God confirms and proclaims the process of reintegration, addressed not to the supplicant, but in third person to the public. It ranges from resonant communication between God and supplicant, still in distress, to regaining social status, kavit peer, and life in abundance. The final verses portray the fate of the praying person from a divine perspective. His trust in God is the basis for deliverance. 
Even hardship does not signify separation from God, but is a temporary state that will lead to reintegration, long life and salvation. This finale ties in resilience factors that Susie O'Brien highlights from a postcolonial perspective in the field of literary studies. The first one is the embeddedness of humans in a more than human world. In the psalm, this shows through in the relationship to God to which demonic powers can pose no real threat. Central to resilience is the embeddedness of the individual in the community as well, which comes with reputation. The supplicant's standing is restored through the speech of God. Even in trouble, the I voice participates in the communal memory of Exodus and the promise of salvation for all of Israel. This perspective of hope is underscored in the Septuagint by reading the word Elpis, Elpizu, hope, into the psalm four times. By this anticipating Pentabrick's statement, hope is the summary of resilience. O'Brien mentions another fundamental factor of resilience. A quote, the capacity both to speak and to be heard. The psalmic trialogue emphasizes that speaking is followed by listening and responding. The psalm's form too makes it easier not to fall silent in distress. Those praying can borrow the words of the psalm as if they were their own and find refuge in them. In doing so, the metaphors become translucent to different experiences of distress and hopes across centuries. In this respect, Psalm 91 reflects a path of compromised and finally reassured resilience. This impact of the psalm is not limited to earlier times. In Brazil, Psalm 91 is even better known than Psalm 23. The open Bible is supposed to protect the hut in the favela, as well as the car on the road, or one's own body. In German-speaking countries, the angelic verse 11 is by far the most common baptismal motto. This is probably due to the widespread belief in angels, According to the recent surveys, uh, more people say they believe in angels than in God. This angelic spirituality is centered around the needs of the respective individual, as in Psalm 91 as well. The advertisement for the jewelry brand Engelsrufer, invoker of angels, puts it in a nutshell. Angels accompany us day and night. They show us the way and give us strength. If you call for them, they are close to you. Hear your wishes and make them come true. This, minus the monetary undercurrent, is a present-day example of apotropaic amulets still in use today. To what extent this angelic spirituality promotes resilience would fill another lecture. At the same time, the prevalent choice of Psalm 91, verse 11, as a baptismal motto, points to the fundamental vulnerability we share today with the people of ancient Israel. Parents know about the vulnerability of life and their limits to protect their children. That is why they wish their child every protection possible at baptism. For God will command his messengers on your behalf to guard you in all your ways. This creates a transitional space, placing the relationship between parent and child in a larger context. It is embedded in a more than human world and in a tradition of praying the psalm that began long before us and will probably continue long after us. For the children, it is not a safe place that is prayed for, but a mobile shelter that allows the parents to let go and the children to stand on their own feet and go their own ways. Also in that, Psalm 91 turns out to be an apotropaic text fostering resilience across centuries and cultures. Thank you very much for your attention. May you stay safe.